My name is Jeff. I'm the president of the San Diego Marine Aquarium Society. So I wanted to thank you guys for coming out. We really appreciate it. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Walt Smith. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Everybody having a good time here at MACNA? Yeah. This is always one of my favorite events of the year, and it's, it, it always comes off. Every year just keeps getting better and better, and we always have a lot of fun. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit about the aquarium industry from different angles. And uh, the first part of my talk will be dealing with what it takes um, to actually set up in a foreign country and what you have to go through and, you know, the, the, basically the involvement that you get uh, dealing with other governments that you've never dealt with before. And then I'll move on to how it benefits, you know, the, uh, the local country that you're in. In uh, my case, we've been in th three countries over the uh, years, in the last 27 years. But um, what does it take? It takes guts. It takes a lot of persistence and passion. Passion probably most of all, because um, we're crazy to do this in the first place, right? You know, go to a foreign country and set up and do all that stuff. So if you don't have the passion, it's not gonna work. And a lot of patience. You're dealing with you know, people that are not used to uh, what it is we do to, for a living and how we're gonna support them. And um, the general attitudes uh, and customs are so much different that you have to be able to adapt uh, to what, what that country, uh, you know, how they operate and, and how they think and how they've been raised and what their local customs are. And it takes a bit of money, and you'll, you'll see some of that, um, you know, shortly, and a lot of luck. And it's not easy, um, you know, to stay there. So if you're lucky, you get to make a living. You get to, you know, enjoy a country. Some people say, oh, you live in paradise, and how cool is that? And I say, well, you know, there's a lot of things that you probably don't know. And then who does this benefit, you know? How, do, how does it benefit? We, well, we create jobs education and training, uh, the local spending and the local merchants for supplies and equipment and, and uh, continue uh, usage of uh, you know, services such as electricity and fuel. And um, that's uh, a big part of how the, the country benefits, not only that, but from the taxes and the employment that we provide. And then what are your chances of survival after you've done all those, gone through all of that and made those steps? Well, from my personal experience, like I just mentioned, um, I've been involved with three countries, three countries over the years, and to my best recollection, I can remember 27 startups, me being one of them, and out of that, there's only seven remaining. So a lot of people think that this is their road to fortune, or it's something that they think they want to do, but it doesn't work out, and uh, there's uh, four of us still in Fiji, and uh, Vanuatu, I had a station there for just about a year, and I'm one of those people that you know, didn't make it there. It was just too difficult to run two stations at once. And of course, Tonga we started, was our first country. We started in uh, 1989. And I finally, uh, that lasted 21 years. And finally, it got too hard to manage as Fiji grew. And we shut it down in 2010. But um, overall, uh, at, our, at our best count, as, as good as we could uh, you know, do any research, We've come up with 48 locations that participate in the marine aquarium trade around the world. And if you look at that map, you kind of see they're straight across, you know, generally hoovering around the equator, the cor you know, coral reefs um, in the tropic zones. So 48 countries benefit from uh, the, the presence of the marine aquarium trade. And in many countries, such as Indonesia, it's a multitude of companies that are there. Uh, in Fiji, there's uh, four operating today. There's five licenses. One is dormant at the moment. And in Tonga, there's a couple. But other, other countries, uh, say like the Cook Islands, there's only one. Uh, Solomon Islands, there's only one. So uh, it really does uh, depend on, you know, what you're able to accomplish in these countries. And um, how does the marine aquarium trade provide benefits to the local economy? Well, it, like I mentioned earlier, it creates employment. It creates a lot of employment. Um, in our, uh, it, for tens of thousands of, of, of divers and, and workers and, and, and trainees that are learning how to pack fish and get them to you alive, fish and coral. Um, and, the, and the communities are in very remote areas often that have uh, fewer employment opportunities and less welfare provisions. So they really depend on us. So if we have one employee 
he may be feeding up to 15 mouths. You know, not only his family, but also his relatives' families uh, there in, in the same village. And, um, you know, going, getting on to what it takes, what is your investment? Well, one small investment you need to consider is you have to buy all the dive gear for these people. In our case, we have 35 divers. That's a lot of equipment. That's a lot of tanks. We, we own and operate uh, several hundred uh, tanks. Uh, everybody gets BCDs and, and masks and so forth. That's mostly bought locally, or if we buy it here in the States and ship it there, um, it has to be, you know, large duties are paid to the government. So in one way or another, we are supporting that, that country through that, those purchases. It takes a lot of boat, engines, fuel, in our case, and I can only speak exactly what I can relate to with our, our company in Fiji. Uh, we operate seven boats, 13 engines, ranging from 60 horsepower to 250 horsepower, and we utilize over, over, well over $20,000 of fuel per month. And that, um, you know, the, the fuel companies a benefit, benefit from us as well that are all locally owned. Um, and all boats are built by local craftsmen. All of our boats, we don't import them, are, are, are built locally. Uh, this is the latest addition to our fleet. We, uh, we call it the Lady Sadie, named after our, our first, uh, Deb and I's first granddaughter. And um, this boat can operate with 12 divers and two crew. So again, there's more employment just than that. Um, the trucks and the vehicles are all bought locally. And sometimes people don't think about that as part of your investment, but you know, uh, because we're dealing with salt water, it's really a, a, a re it's it's a replaceable thing constantly. Um, you can see just after two years, the truck is pretty much rusty and has to be replaced. Um, so that that investment is there. Then uh, a large capital investment in holding systems for fish, coral, and rocks. Um, I think Bob's Bob Fenner's here. He's he's been down there several times. And he's uh, actually helped us build some of our system. Uh, you, know, you know what it takes. You have to design, then manufacture, and ship it in, in most cases. And this alone supports uh, well over 50 people, uh, employees there. Uh, overall, we have 140 people in our organization that we support. But about 50 of them are in the, in the coral and fish rooms and in the support uh, teams that you know, also help you know, the divers get out to water and, and, you know, so forth. The nets, because nets are made in Fiji, we pay a very high duty to bring nets in. And uh, that also is another way that, you know, we support the country. Uh, the nets have to be repaired daily. No net that's made in Fiji suits us for our business. They're all made to catch larger fish. So, you know, the netting is pretty large. Fish swim th right through them. So we have to get specially designed nets from other countries and, and, uh, and bring them in. The shipping boxes, we use three components in our shipping boxes, all made locally. That's styrofoam, cardboard box, and plastic liners. We can utilize up to five to 700 boxes a week. So uh, we're actually the largest customer that the styrofoam company has. And uh, they, they heavily depend on our, in our, in our survival. Um, with the truck, the tr trucks come a couple times a week dropping off supplies. And then again, talking about employment, we have a team of about three people that do nothing but make boxes all day because it comes in, you know, like I just mentioned, separate, you know, separate entities. So you got the box that has to be folded and taped, styrofoam put inside, and then the liners. Um, we buy all the plastic bags locally, you know, up to forty to fifty thousand plastic bags a month. You know, the fish have to travel in something. We don't import them in, but there's three companies in Fiji that make bags, and we try to get the best quality uh, manufacturer that's 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 available. And sometimes that changes. Sometimes we've been dealing with a guy for years and his bags start leaking, so we have to go to the other guy. And um, w airline support. We are the largest um, export, air freight exporter out of Fiji. Um, and it, it, a lot of people say, well, why are the fish so expensive or the coral so expensive? Uh, air freight alone more than doubles our price. So 47% of our revenue goes directly to the airlines. And also we provide education. There's Sadie, by the way. Um, the education is a key to the understanding of our environmental issues. We entertain many schools uh, that come through on field trips. And we have a marine bi biologist on staff that is able to, to entertain these um, schools, show them little slideshows such as this one, tell them what the industry is all about and uh, what, it, what it means to the, the, their country. A lot of the locals have never even been in the water. The, a lot of times they say, well, Where'd the color on these fish come from? They don't see these kind of fish. The only fish they see 
are the fish that their local villagers go out and catch for food. So, how does all this come together and uh, you know, become a business? How does all this happen? Well, early in the morning, every day, um, about 7.30, the divers meet with our uh, livestock manager. There, a lot of you know David Barrick. He's been with us for a little over a year and a half. And uh, he, he will meet with the divers every morning and tell them what they need, the list they're made. The divers just don't go out and catch whatever. It's all organized by uh, the needs, the orders coming up, uh, what requirements we have for those. And then uh, every morning all the fuel has to be checked for the boats. So we have to make sure that the fuel is av available and ready uh, to reach sometimes the distances that we travel uh, require um, you know hundreds of liters of fuel uh, just for one day's work. At 8 a.m., uh, the divers uh, after the meeting they start gathering all their gear and get getting ready to go. And of course we have three teams. Well, actually four teams. We have fish divers, coral divers. We have divers that manage the coral farms that we have, and then we also have the divers that go out and get the live rock. So there's four teams that go out almost daily. Um, maybe the, the, the coral farm, maybe two or three times a week, but the other three teams go out every single day. About 8.30 in the morning, the divers are, lo are loaded off and ready to go to the wharf. Sometimes it's not necessary to drive to the wharf because our property is right on the sea, and we do have our own wharf, but it's tide dependent. So if, uh, the, if it's low tide at 8 o'clock in the morning, we can't use our own wharf, we have to drive you know, down to the fisheries wharf and, and uh, launch from there. And what happens when we get there, we have to hire another boat just to take the captains to our boat. So this boat will load, load up the divers, take, um, that's a nice thumb. <laughs> it'll, it'll, <laughs> thanks, Deb. I can tell by the fingerprints whose that is. Anyway, um, that, that, that guy that you see there will take our captains out to the various boats. The captains have to be highly regulated and highly trained. Um, we're, we're checked every morning by MSAF, which stands for Marine Safety, uh, Safety Authority, and they have to check the licenses, check the gear, and, and find out where we plan to go for the day. All of this is a matter of record. Um, and once everything is, is uh, once the boats are back to the wharf, then uh, the loading starts, and um, that takes quite a while, loading all those bo different boats, and off they go. Whoop. Well, Anyway, that's a little, uh, there we are loading the boat. I didn't know that was there. So once they're loaded and ready, off to sea they go. Now this is probably sometime about nine o'clock. And we get all the boats out. And then, you know, what happens after that? Um, sometimes they come in at noon. Sometimes they don't come in until five o'clock at night, depending on the location where they're going to collect the gear and so forth. Um, and we also have another station about 400 kilometers away from our main station up in the northern island, island of Punalebu. And that um, is a completely different environment than uh, what we're used to in our uh, warehouse that's near the airport. Here, they had to take about an hour's drive by truck to, to get to this little village that's on a river. And once they do all the loading and everything like, like, like you just saw, um, they have to travel down that river that you see on the bottom there for about 20 minutes before they get to the ocean. And then it's about an hour to get to the collecting spot. So it's really an involved kind of, kind, of, kind of organization that you have to make sure that you're prepared for everything that comes up to make all this happen. And a lot of people have asked, you know, well, are you sustainable? How do you catch the fish? Do you use drugs? Do you use dynamite? Um, Really? Do you use dynamite? Uh, it comes up, believe it or not. But I can show you here, um, I believe. There it is. The way they catch the fish, and a lot of people have asked me this just in this past weekend, is they set up a fence net. So it's a net that has weights on the bottom and floats on the top and it creates a fence in the water. And then what the diver does is he swims towards that fence, chases fish towards it, and when they stop on this wall that they didn't know was there, then it's easy enough just to catch them, um, you know, hand net them and then put them in his collection bucket. Um, these are specially trained Filipino divers that have been through the Nets pro Netsman program in the Philippines. Um, these particular Philippine divers have never seen cyanide or never used it. 
and they're very highly trained. Some of these divers can produce up, uh, up to and over 300 fish a day. And, and sometimes you have a pretty good day. Now, Bob was, in, Bob was involved in the, in the northern station. He goes, I don't know, Walt, I don't see any fish here today. But that was in the two days we were, we were diving there just doing a survey. What it turned out to be uh, eventually is our most productive station. We, that's where we get all of our center pygies, all of our lemon peels, coral beaties, bicolors come from there, the sunburst antheas, the Scots fairy wrasse, uh, flame hawks if we're lucky to find them, and blue tanks. Uh, just this week alone, we, we got pretty close to 600 blue tangs. I don't know if you know, but we caught a couple hundred yesterday. Yeah, so um, it, it turns out to be a very worthwhile investment. But what, and sometimes you get in the water and you just, in this particular shot, Deb and I were out surveying looking for broodstock to start a new coral farm with a new village we were working with. And uh, sometimes that's the reaction uh, that you have when you get up. You just can't believe what you just saw. So for those reasons, um, new areas can sometimes be very, very productive and exciting. What you see on the bottom left there is um, an area that was completely destroyed by a storm many years ago and it has rendered the most beautiful live rock I have ever seen. And I, I happened to be swimming there. There wasn't much coral, but there was this rubble everywhere. And as I started turning the pieces over, I don't know if I can do this, I'll give it a go. No, as I, oh, okay. As I started turning the pieces over, I was, I was amazed at you know, the coralline algae that was developing on these rocks. Now, you won't see this rock in the industry unless you agree to fly it in, because I am not gonna put this great rock on a boat. Okay, we all, like, we all got that clear? Um, but anyway, it's, th that's what continues to get me excited day after day after day in this business for, that I've been into for 44 years. It's always the new, always the exciting. There's always something happening around the corner that you didn't, didn't expect. And then back at the warehouse, uh, it's business as usual while the divers are out diving and, uh, you know, and while we're waiting for them to come in. Things are buzzing all day long and all night long as well. It's a 24-7 company. And uh, packing orders uh, sometimes can be, like I just said, a 24-7 job, um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on Sunday. And um, we have customers in over 27 different countries right now, um, edging on 30, and um, the flights are going at all hours. So we only pack just, just prior to flight time. So that requires our staff to be available whenever we need them. Sometimes they're not available because things like this happen. Uh, th this is uh, the aftermath of the uh, cyclone we just had, Cyclone Winston's. Uh, many of you have heard about it. Some of you have asked, how's Fiji, you know, when you stop by our booth. Um, a lot of our employees were affected by this. They've lost everything they've ever owned, just off to the wind, blown up the hill, completely gone. So that also disrupts the business as well because now they're home taking care of putting their family back together. So, and then sometimes shipments arrive from the north. From the north, we have to ship our fish to our main station. That requires putting them on a boat, taking a couple hours drive to the ferry, but the, the truck drives on the ferry and then gets off on, on our island, the main island, and then it's a, about a seven hour uh, truck ride from where the boat lands to get to our facility. So these fish um, generally travel pretty close to 20, 24 hours just to get to our station once we pack them up in the north. And the truck just makes continuous circles round and round, it drops, it comes in twice, it's a three day trip for the truck, so um, it comes in twice a week uh, to our station, just keep, keeping uh, the system up in the north emptied. Um, daily cleaning and maintenance is also a fact of life. We have special teams that just clean the coral tanks, the, the, the um, uh, fish tanks, also cleaning the rock and getting it prepared for shipments. And then bringing in the rock. Uh, there's a shot where you can see um, that how we are, are located right on the water. Uh, in this particular case, it came in at high tide. We load the rock up on, a, uh, on these big wooden crates and um, off it comes. We have to drive it across our yard. Uh, in the background, that's where you see uh, where we make the, uh, the um, cultured rock, the man-made rock that you see out on our booth today. Uh, but this, this is the actual live rock. The, the, this particular batch is the Pukani rock that a lot of you are, are interested in. And we'll, the, he'll, he'll drive over to the warehouse, the, the other warehouse part, where then it goes through the cleaning process and packaging. 
Um, and all day long, the reef rock is made. Um, we have a team of six people that do nothing but make rock every day and make the pegs that we plant the corals on. We can make up to 2,000 pegs in a day, and we usually do that about once or twice a week. And uh, we can make a several thousand kilos of rock every day. Now, the rock has to be made daily uh, because it takes from the day we make it until the day we can ship it is about three months because we have to equalize the pH before it's safe for your aquarium. When you use uh, fresh cement to make rock, you, you come up with a pH about 12. And who wants to put a pH, uh, who wants to raise their pH to 12 in your aquarium? So we tried a lot of methods to try to bring that pH down in, in, in quicker ways, but as it turns out, uh, just leaving it in the air and letting car the, the carbon dioxide mix with it and, and neutralize the pH is actually the best way. Um, and like I said, that process is about three months long. Um, many school, school visits during the day, but we have to make sure that they don't come while we're packing because sometimes there's four buses of kids that arrive and start running through the warehouse, slapping on tanks and having all the fish, all the fish have heart attacks and whatever. So um, that's something that we like to say that we contribute a lot. We, we see up to 3,000 students a year. And when these students come in, uh, they learn something they've never seen before. Um, it's also a fact that some of these young kids that came on a, a field trip years later continued their education right through the University of South Pacific Marine Biology and then come and ask us for a job. And that's happened on a couple of cases already. And that makes me pretty proud that, you know, that they were inspired on a field trip to our place to develop their career around what they learned. And then the fish divers start coming in around three or so. Hopefully we're done with the packing by then. Um, and every, they bring in every, every day they show up and they have to put all the fish away. We put them on the uh, acclimating table from out of the ocean. And they go onto this table. Every diver is paid by the piece. So they have separate sections so that we can count each diver's catch. Uh, and we also have village meetings that happen quite regular. Um, the village uh, earns a lot of money from our company. We pay them yearly fees to, to dive on their reef. We also uh, you know, hire a lot of their, the, the, the villages, uh, villagers themselves to work in our factory. Uh, here you see we're making a deal with the, the new area that I just told you about, and that that's the chief in the middle there signing the contract. Those contracts are binding, and we guarantee them, you know, uh, they guarantee us the right to be there, and we in turn guarantee them uh, certain benefits and it varies from village to village. In this particular village, uh, none, none of their homes had water. So they did have a, um, a well from the mainland coming from a stream, the pipe all the way under the ocean, up, and, and we're talking several miles of pipe, and water was just coming out of the end of the pipe, but it couldn't get to the houses. So what we did is we, you know, we organized a big reservoir and brought them a water pump to pump to the reservoir that was up the hill so that then it can gravity feed down to all the villages. I can't tell you how amazed these people were that they finally had water in their home and they didn't have to walk with buckets back from the well back to their little, um, what they call bury in, in Fiji. And then each diver is taught to put their own coral and fish away and learn how to pro properly handle them uh, for best survival. Again, they're paid by the piece, but if it's dead, they don't get paid. If it's collected improperly, they don't get paid if the wrong size. So. It's sort of a self-training process. They learn very quickly what they're going to be paid for and, and how they're going to be paid. And if it, if it doesn't survive, uh, there's no pay for them. Uh, our our uh, fish and coral divers are some of the highest paid people in Fiji. Um, this guy that you see here on the right putting his coral away, uh, he can earn o over a thousand bucks a week just, just collecting coral. And uh, I'm talking about a country where the average pay is $60 a week. Meanwhile, the packing is just finishing up about 4.30. Um, it's, you know, th th these, these lucky packers get to go home for a couple hours before they have to come back and start the night pack. So like I said, it's a 24-7 20, job. And, um, and believe it or not, they love it. The more, the more hours they can put in, the higher their pay, the more they're able to you know, feed their family and, and buy the necessary things day to day. After the pack is done, uh, then the office staff kicks in, has to check all the CITES documents, all the permits, everything has to be perfectly lined up with, with what's in each box. Um, that takes a team of about three people to make sure everything is perfect. Spot checkers and, and uh, you know, check, we have checkers that check the checkers. 
because if one thing is wrong with the permit, the whole entire shipment can be seized. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife loves to look through the boxes and make sure everything's correct, and it's our responsibility to make sure that it is. But then now I'm going to talk about a few things that maybe you, you don't know, uh, or maybe you do, but I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you anyway so you can get to hear it again. But, um, and by the way, um, I'm in the process of writing a, a, a children's book that uh, teaches people about their reef, so I'm going to utilize some of my characters here uh, to bring these points across. And um, in this case, the ornamental fish tree, trade is a high volume uh, catch, but uh, limited to, uh, with very limited demand on any, any given resource. Uh, the ornamental uh, marine industry represents at most 0.0006% of the fish caught in the sea globally. We're talking about 80 million tons of fish are collected or harvested from the sea uh, annually. Seven to 33 million of those tons are bycatch or waste that are never used, just dumped back in the sea dead. The ornamental fish trade, 70 tons annually. 70 compared to 80 million. So it's really minuscule compared to what's actually harvested in the sea. But who's criticized the most for taking harvest from the sea? Our industry, of course. We're constantly under the gun. We have our good friends over in Hawaii, like, like Snorkel Bob, who would like to see this industry completely disappear. But they don't take the time to think about how this industry benefits people, how it provides employment and income. And, and, and not only that, but it also provides awareness. I mean, there's no hobby that I can think of that provides more global awareness for conservation than the marine aquarium hobby, and especially reef tanks. Um, People, you know, I'm sure that you've all experienced your friends coming to your house and seeing your beautiful tank, and oh my God, how beautiful is that? And all of a sudden, they become passionate reef, reef conservatives or uh, conservationists just because they had an experience with a live marine aquarium in someone's home or in a public aquarium like the one we went to the other night at Scripps. This is the this is the, the one of the biggest benefits that you know gives me goose pimples thinking about how we can create conservationists just by our hobby. Um, there's there's two things in the world that you know people really depend on, and that that's the rainforest and the reef. And uh, the reef lately has gotten the most attention uh, because of global warming and because of you know all the things that are happening. So it's up to us to be responsible stewards to show the to show the world that this is not only an enjoyable hobby, but it also fosters an appreciation you know, for, the, for the global, not only global economy, but also the global conservationist uh, effort. Okay, and here's some of the other, other characters. Um, the collection of fish for aquariums has never caused a species to become extinct or threatened in the wild. There's a lot of talk about the Bangai Cardinal, maybe that comes the closest of ever, but it's still a um, very, very debatable subject. But there's no other fish that has. Um, many small reef fish bred, are, are bred daily, or they breed daily, uh, because of the competition on the reef and because of predators and the competition on the reef. A lot of these fish, they live in holes or hiding places or, or are competitive with one another. So when, you, when a, one of our collectors will, will take that fish, the very next day, there's another fish in that same spot where the one was. And we know this for a fact because I've been uh, down in that area for uh, about 27 years now. And uh, in Tonga from, from uh, 89 to 2010, like I just mentioned, in Fiji from 1995 to, to present day. And uh, we, we still collect the same exact reefs uh, for fish. They're always there. The divers still bring in the same numbers. They're still able to make the same amount of money. And that's proof alone uh, that if you're going to be diving a reef for over 20 years, you'd think you'd be depleting the resource. But it just, it's just not the case. The fish are always available, and that's, that, that's living proof that it is. Um, and aquarium fish are the most renewable fishery on the planet. It's a renewable fishery. Try to say that about tuna. Try to say that about snapper. And a good example of some ridiculous things that happen in, uh, in this trade in 2007, the Maldive tuna export, using green chromis for bait, averaged about $1,500 a ton. In 2007, the marine ornamental fish export, 
using only small nets to catch their fish, averaged about $590,000 a ton. There's a difference in the value of how, um, you know, the, the small fish that you see uh, my buddy there uh, holding in a bag is worth so much more than the green chromis they're using. Um, however, in the Maldives, the green chromis are banned for marine ornamental export because they save them for the bait. The ornamental fish create, uh, creates 372 times more value than overfished uh, food fish for the exporting country. And that's really considerable because uh, when, we first started, when we first opened in Tonga, um, the biggest competition we had for airline space was the food fish. And uh, we were competing all the time with the tonnage that they had. And it was amazing how, much, how many fish they could catch. It was also amazing what those fish were worth not anywhere near compared to one of our boxes compared to one of their boxes. But today those industries are gone. They're not even in Tonga anymore. And why? Because they had to keep going further and further and further to catch fish. Our industry is still catching fish on the same reef that we started you know, back 27 years ago. The direct benefits of the marine ornamental, ornamental trade uh, to the local village economy is also I've, I've already gone over that quite extensively, but you can see you know, wh what the benefits are just by going to the village. Uh, some of our villages have toilets for the first time, electricity for the first time. I mentioned just uh, a little while ago running water for the first time um, in their buries. So there's a, there's a huge benefit to the local economy. The local economy does not want to see our, our industry disappear. They're, they're some of our biggest supporters. You go to these villages and uh, they're, they're just, you know, they've got no way to be employed in a village out in the middle of, of nowhere. And they're mostly substance fishing and farming is how they support their families. So when we come there, we're able to benefit them with cash. Cash for the goods, cash for their site. And that means a lot to them. Now they can send their kids to school. They can take bus rides to far, far off places uh, to, to go to school. Uh, some of them travel across the country and are able to stay in another city uh, that may be four hours away. Uh, why they get educated. A lot of this is, is pos made possible through our industry. And to use a phrase from an old song, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Did you know that the coral carefully harvested, of course you know, uh, and is kept alive in the aquarium trade, uh, is weight for weight worth 100 times more than that same coral that is uh, crushed and burnt to create cement for buildings. It's also important to note that it has been, uh, that it has been recorded that the cement industry alone is responsible for 5% of the CO2 emissions on Earth. So they're using coral to kill coral, basically. And I'm sure you also know this, uh, that, that fish and coral are collected with uh, you know, the sole aim of keeping them alive. Fish are collected in very small nets compared to large trawlers for food fish. Coral is collected in a very selective, is very selectively for color, shape, and size uh, with scalpel-like pre precision on the reef. And a good example of that, we're constantly being monitored by science, and some of the scientists that come out on the boat with us to watch our collection to make sure we're sustainable, we have to turn in reports every year about this. Um, they'll co often comment, you know, I can't even tell where you've been. And it's been estimated that one in 10,000 pieces of coral is, are, would, 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 would only interest us. The rest of it, it's either too big or the wrong shape or the wrong color, and we leave it alone. One in 10,000 pieces. So that's a highly sustainable um, uh, collection that benefits the local economy. And the fish and coral can live longer in an aquarium. A lot of us know this. I was just talking to um, somebody yesterday talking about what, you know, what is the longest fish. I think it was Jake Adams who was saying he did some research and there are fish that have been you know, well over 25 years kept in an aquarium. They don't live that long in the ocean, not, not, not many of them. Um, predators see to that. And then also what this industry provides is things like, similar to what we've started in Fiji. A couple of years ago, I, I uh, registered what we call the AID project, which stands for the Aquacul <coughs> excuse me, Aquaculture Development for the Environment. And the goal for that project, it's a nonprofit organization registered here in the States, and the goal for that is to do, take 45 villagers 
throughout Fiji in different locations and have them each grow 1,000 pieces of coral a month. Is this possible? Well, I think so. We've been doing it since 1998 already. And uh, we, we, we support four villages, four village farms today. And uh, why we had to create this uh, is because we can't support 45 villagers. There's only so many people like yourselves that want to buy coral. And if I, if I, the, the villagers won't do it for free. So we had to uh, set up a, a, th this project uh, that, that gets pu you know, funded uh, by public funds and donors. Uh, we'll send money and now we can, you know, pay the villagers to plant the coral. They're not going to do it uh, for free. Excuse me. They're not going to do it for free. So they, it creates a, a job for them and uh, they become caretakers of their own resource and they actually learn a lot uh, in the process while they're doing this. So it, our industry spawns programs like this. There's many programs like this around the world that have been spawned by our industry. And I, if you want to learn more about that, Stop by our booth, and we have a little brochure we can give you, and you know, tell you how the how the whole program works, and we can discuss it face to face. So that's about all I have, and um, I'd like to say, Vinaka Bakalevu, thank you very much, and I appreciate your attention and your attendance. Thank you.